There's new drama with Team USA, Olympic events are on the verge of cancellation, and legalized gambling is starting to produce measurable negative effects around the country. It's Tuesday, July 30th. I'm your host for the week, John Shames, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Team USA did a redraft, Caitlin Clark would likely be on the team, at least according to selection committee member Don Staley. Sunday, the South Carolina coach told media members that if Clark had been playing at this high of a level when the team was announced, she, quote, would be in really high consideration of making the team because she's playing head and shoulders above a lot of people. Staley's team faced off against Clark in last season's NCAA championship where CC scored 30. She's now recorded over 10 assists in eight of her last 10 WNBA games. The Sen might not be clean enough after all, and some water-based events are in serious doubt for this week. The men's and women's triathlon events, scheduled for today and tomorrow respectively, have already been given contingency plans to move to Thursday and Friday if these heavy rains continue, which contribute to increased levels of pollution in the water. Canadian women's soccer head coach Bev Priestman has been banned for one year in the aftermath of last week's Olympic drone scandal. And on Sunday, she apologized to her players and took accountability while emphasizing that she would cooperate with investigators. The reigning gold medalists were deducted six points from their group stage total as well. French infrastructure was under attack, and the latest incident targets internet service. Sunday night, French officials discovered severed fiber optic cables that contributed to a loss of internet and phone service across six different regions of the country. It's unclear whether the attacks were directly related to the Olympics, but this is the second time French infrastructure has been attacked during the games. Also, Manchester United is now considering building a stadium that can host up to 100,000 people. If the project is officially greenlit before the end of this calendar year, the club hopes to have the new building erected by 2030. On Saturday, Man U and Arsenal squared off at SoFi Stadium, and former United striker Andy Cole said, SoFi, quote, set the standard for the English club's next facility. UFC 304 took place this Saturday night, and in very unique form, Dana White doubled the fighters' bonuses from the standard 50K to 100. Well, that initiative's over. After a night that saw a full slate of decision wins and zero KOs, Dana has walked back on that idea, saying, quote, upping the bonuses doesn't change anything. It doesn't make anybody fight any harder. It doesn't change anything. I'm not doing this again, ever. It was fun while it lasted. I sat down with FOS reporter Alex Schiffer to discuss a new study on the societal effect of legalized gambling in the U.S. that details bankruptcy, missed car payments, and low credit scores. That conversation is coming up next. All right, I am joined now by breaking news reporter here at Front Office Sports, Alex Schiffer. Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show this morning. Happy to be part of your guest debut uh, run. (laughs) Guest host, listen, guest, uh, guest host, Ron. Listen, uh, I'm happy you're here. It's nice to have some familiar faces. And it's also nice to be talking about an issue that I think kind of affects people in, in our generation, as we were talking about, you know, before we started this. Um, and that's gambling. So you sat down this weekend um, with three California academics who had co-authored this paper, The Financial Consequences of Legalized Sports Gambling. Um, and you got to sit down with Poet Larson. Um, one of the authors of that. What were some of the things that you discussed and what were some of the things that he revealed in the study that they conducted about the effects of gambling nationwide? Yeah, you know, they took a big picture look at what have some of the early returns been, for lack of a better phrase, because to your point, I, I think sports gambling is something that's still relatively new in our society. And they're finding that currently people who gamble on sports are more likely to file for bankruptcy and have deferments on car payments and have a lower credit score. And uh, it was interesting talking to him because, you know, he obviously is an academic, you and I are not. And, you know, I asked him, you know, I imagine at some point during the research that you would have had some kind of ideas to how it's going to turn out or, or, you know, what direction it's trending in. And for him to kind of say that it was even worse than he was expecting, I thought really kind of hit home. And, And it was also interesting because to your point, you know, we're two young males and the study found that it's more rampant in men around our age than anywhere else. And I'm I'm sure you do too. You know, I have a ton of friends who gamble on sports. I have been at the gym and people have come up to me knowing I'm a reporter saying, what do you think of this parlay? And, uh, 
you, you know, John, I don't like to be involved with people's money. I think there's fewer things more personal than money. And if you cost someone money or make someone think you cost them money, um, that's not a great place to be. So uh, I, I thought it was very interesting just hearing how the, the results may be even worse than they thought they were going to be during the research process and just kind of how rampant it is in our generation, especially amongst men and how, you know, even thinking about it, I have plenty of female friends and I can't think of any of them that gamble on sports, but are huge sports fans. And so just a lot of different aspects of the study really spoke to me, whether it be the target demographic, the results, and just that this is getting started and this is already the returns and I feel like it's only going to get worse. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because although legalized gambling is kind of a new wave, gambling has been around for a long time and offshore mm -hmm. gambling has always been something that's available for a college male. You know, it's probably not that difficult to find a, an offshore bookie. Um, and you hear a lot of, a, a lot about the damages kind of from that aspect, from this, from the illegal side of it. But I almost feel like, and I wonder if you feel the same, like the legalized version of this was supposed to help regulate things and obviously help states collect, you know, taxes and, and increase their revenue and, and by taking some of these profit splits. But I almost feel like you know, it's so much more acceptable now and it's so much more in the public eye around from a cultural perspective, right? Like, no, it's no longer, oh, you're a degenerate gambling. Now it's, hey, everyone does this. It's legal. It's easy. It's advertised 50 times when you get on the, the subway or the path train from Hoboken, you know, to come to New York. And like, it is so in your face. And I wonder if that has played a role in kind of this widespread societal issue where like maybe the extremes aren't as extreme as they were when it was an offshore primarily um, industry. But now it's like you have a lot more people being affected by this than, than ever before. Yeah, I definitely think it's been normalized for lack of a better word, right? You know, if, if you're at the bar and you just lost whatever the money line was on Yankees Red Sox, well, maybe the guy two, you know, two bar stools down from you just had the same thing happen to him. And I definitely think that there's like a a more communal thing with it now than maybe there ever was to your point. Maybe there used to be one or two people who either had a bookie or went to off track betting. There's some of those in the city. Uh, now it's, it's right to your phone, obviously. And that's another aspect of this, but it's interesting. The study did not get into like the tax revenue aspects of this and some of the, the reasons why the States got into this from a revenue perspective, but it, it would be interesting to kind of, and it also didn't get into like, you know, what's the sport that's the most gambled on or that's, you know, is there one that's more of the problem than the other, but it, it is interesting just how I, I feel like it's very acceptable. And now it's, it's, if you're losing money on gambling, well, yeah, like 10 other people around you are too. So it's not, it's not this taboo thing. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons why, again, we're not academics, but I think that the, the normalcy of it has also probably made it people maybe keep going instead of maybe thinking they have a problem or, or should maybe slow down how much money they're wagering because you know there there's like an all we're all in this together type thing now with some of it knowing how widespread this has become and how normalized this has become was there a sense um when you had this conversation that there's going to be some type of like public response to this like is this something that they hope lawmakers and policymakers become aware of is it something that they want to address what's kind of the next step for this pandemic going forward yeah, you know, I asked that exact question to Poet. I said to him, you know, uh, if you were, if someone with the power to enact change, whoever that may be, whether it be the CEO of BetMGM or, you know, someone thinking about bringing sports gambling to their state, I said, what would you want them to take away? And, uh, and you know, he said, you know, we, in their academic terms, like, you know, we're trying to just kind of stick to the conclusions of the paper. I'm not trying to give any hot takes. But he said, you know, that we want this information out there for people who are deciding whether or not to do it, to be able to process this and consider it as part of the equation that what we're seeing so far isn't good. It's probably only going to get worse. And if you're if you're thinking about bringing this to the legislation and make it legal in your state or area or bring a casino, whatever it may be, that this is something that's part of your equation. So they didn't have an exact answer on that. And, and I understand, you know, the reason to do so. But it, it is interesting, you know, how this ages. I mean, do we see a before and after effect with some of this of, of maybe there's some stuff that slows down that was all of a sudden ramping ahead. You know, I think, you know, in our neck of the woods of New York City, Steve Cohen, the Mets owner, is trying to bring a casino to Queens outside of the ballpark because there's nothing to do at City Field outside of go to the game. I went to Friday's game and, and didn't get there early for that reason. 
Um, so I, the thing that I'm kind of curious about is, as we see, you know, I know Oklahoma doesn't have uh, legalized sports gambling. I know D.C., I think, recently, you know, kind of balked at it for a bit. Um, do we see, like, this become more of a topic of conversation in the pushback against it? That's where I, I'm kind of wondering where this goes. Yeah, that is going to be a very interesting dynamic to watch as, as this only gets more widespread in society. But we're going to have to make sure that we're aware of these dangers. And it sounds like Poet Larson is is doing his, uh, you know, his share to make sure that, that that's in the public eye. So, Alex, thank you so much for, for this conversation. Thanks for that article and excited to see what the future of, of legalized gambling in the United States may hold. Excited might not be the word given the tone of the conversation, <laughs> but I'm curious to see where it goes, too. Thanks for having me, man. Does Jalen Brown know something about Team USA that we don't? Teammate Jason Tatum's benching in a blowout win on Sunday has reignited a conversation about the factors behind the scenes of USA basketball. I caught up with Colin Salau and Dan Roberts to unpack the latest in this saga. All right, now we have the fun opportunity of having a little three-way conversation. Here we get to catch up with our new editor-in-chief, Dan Roberts, as well as our reporter, Colin Salau. We're going to be talking about some of the Team USA drama that was on the horizon this weekend and how that's kind of built up over time. So, Colin, can you kind of get us up to speed on this whole situation with Jalen Brown, Team USA, Grant Hill, everything that's going on here? It's kind of been unfolding for a number of weeks now, um, but it seems to really have come to a head this weekend. So kind of take us through the, the facts of what's going on in this situation. Yeah, so two weeks ago, or I think almost three weeks ago now, uh, Jalen Brown was not chosen to replace Kawhi Leonard on Team USA. Instead, they gave it to his teammate, Derek White. And then Jalen Brown went on social media, started to do some of those cryptic tweets. But he had one specific tweet that wasn't so cryptic. It was tagging Nike and asking them, hey, what's going on? So he has this, um, he, he, he was asked in a press uh, by some reporters at Summer League, and he said, yeah, he thinks that Nike has some sort of involvement into why he didn't make Team USA. Now, Grant Hill, speaking this weekend, um, explains to the Dan, on the Dan Patrick show that, um, you know, it wasn't because of, of any conspiracy theory. That's what he says. It was because of um, looking for finding a balance in the team. You know, Derek White is more of a role player in a team full of superstars. And they wanted someone who could be a guard defender. Um, and then Jalen Brown responded once again on social media on X um, by saying, "Hey, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Um, I've been, you know, I'm a, I, I've been in the uh, a vice president of the NB, NBPA for for years now. Um, and so now it's you know it, it's we have the team trying to win gold, but there's this." thing on the side between a guy who's not on the team but is the finals MVP in the NBA and the president of USA Basketball. Guys, I mean, to jump in on this, as if we needed any more drama involving this year's Celtics squad, right? And uh, John, here's where you and I should divulge our allegiances that we're both Celtics fans. Um, I'm, I'm big on everyone just uh, disclosing their biases. We all have them. Everyone's got a team. I think it would be silly if we pretended we didn't. So I'm a Boston guy. I'm a Celtics fan. And when we won the finals, Banner 18, what up? Uh, I saw so many takes from people being like, boring, boring. And I get it. I, I do. I think there's a lot of people that think that between Tatum and Jalen, they're not the two most charismatic stars in the league. Um, you know, set that aside for a minute. But here now we have yet another story involving Jalen. And by the way, if we want to bring in the fact that as we record this, we just had the first game and they didn't play Tatum. And Steve Kerr had to respond and address that. And this was after Jalen, surprising to some, took the finals MVP trophy, not Jason Tatum. So, and I'm willing to believe and take them at their word that there's no drama between them, that there's nothing there. But boy, it's like, the story continues when it comes to Jalen and Tatum and their stature and how they're respected or in their eyes, maybe not respected by everyone. Uh, and then you bring in Nike. There's a lot here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I do want to focus on this idea of like Jalen Brown's developing brand and and kind of like how he's emerged from this pool of athletes, right? Like you have all these superstars on Team USA. They're having a great time. And then you have Jalen kind of looking in from the outside and we know 
historically in his career, he's been someone who's like not afraid to ruffle feathers and put his reputation on the line for what he thinks is right. So like, Colin, when you're looking at the situation, right, obviously there's this conspiracy idea that there's some political machine working behind the scenes of Team USA. But what do you think is the significance from Jalen Brown's personal brand, whether that fact is true or not? What do you think of him kind of taking on this massive machine, taking on Nike, taking on Team USA and just saying, hey, I'm willing to put myself out there, willing to put my reputation on the line a little bit here? Yeah, I think to your point, he's he's becoming he's I think he's the developing like what LeBron James did, which is give players player empowerment. That was his legacy in the NBA. It was to say, hey, you guys can do whatever you want. Because now you can be more influential in your own brand. I think this is kind of Jalen Brown taking that, you know, three steps further. We've seen other people do it. Now Brown's like, well, I, I have this $300 million contract. I'm set with m- my money. But I also believe in certain things. Now, you know, you could say what you want about what he believes in. And if you, you know, side with him. But he's empowered to do that. And I think, you know... We're seeing a lot of other players, but specifically with brand sponsorships, you know, the likes of Nikola Jokic are going with, you know, Chinese brands. Kyrie is going with a Chinese brand. So Jalen Brown has not signed a deal uh, for a sneaker since 2021 when he left Adidas. I think he's just, you know, telling him, saying, I believe in this. This is what I want. And this is where players are, especially in the NBA nowadays. We should say, I, I, I don't want to get it wrong and quote the exact stat, but I saw a tweet uh, after the finals that uh, Jalen was the first finals MVP without a signature shoe deal in some amount of years. Uh, so just as you said, Colin, I mean, this this is notable. Now, I get the impression he can have one if and when he wants it. I mean, maybe I'll be wrong about that, I, you know. But let's add to the mix. It's becoming a long list. How about uh, Stephen A. reading on air a text from an NBA source, this was during the playoff run, that people don't like Jalen because he has a big ego and that he's a locker room problem. And of course, Jalen famously retweeted it and said, state your source. And that became a t-shirt that Celtics players wore at the victory parade. Um, You know, I am not a full-time NBA reporter. I will say though that years ago when I was at Yahoo Finance, uh, we had Jalen Brown in for an interview and it was when he was so young, I I think 2015 and he had just been named or maybe 2016, he had just been named uh, to the NBA PA board or, or the, the second rep VP, whatever that title is. And, you know, he didn't strike me as someone who remotely has an ego. Um, now, of course, it's been a few years and now he's become extremely good, but um, I'm willing to take his word for it. And I just, I love that, you know, tweeted out. I think Colin's right. LeBron laid a lot of groundwork for this. Remember, shut up and dribble. I mean, that one phrase, that one moment um, fueled athletes across multiple sports to speak their mind, not worry anymore about the PR machine and being told, "Mm, don't say that, delete that, state your source. I love it. Yeah. I think also too, there's an aspect here of right, like a a David versus Goliath situation too, right? Like Jalen Brown's not going to back down. We saw him step up in the moment in the finals. You know, he was a, a, a leading scorer for the Celtics. I think he finished just under Tatum for the series average, right? For points per game. But he was, he was being a force and asserting himself. And, and, you know, we've heard we've heard a lot this, you know, this offseason and, and with Team USA on the women's side, too, about Caitlin Clark's mission on the team and kind of like the forces that be here. And again, I don't want to speculate too much. Right. But like there has to be some level of like this political vibe to Team USA where, you know, Tatum supports Brown and then two days later he doesn't play a minute. Right. And and, you know, uh, Caitlin Clark, you know, Dawn, Dawn Staley now saying that they kind of wish she was on the team to begin with. Right. Like there's someone or something it feels like in the organization that might be playing a role where it might just exceed the, hey, it's only basketball that Steve Kerr was trying to say at the beginning of this week. Yeah, I want to say, like, you know, conspiracy theories range. Right. There are sure. some that are probably, you know, really wildly, you know, just just out of the spectrum. But then I think there are some that have some form of reference point, right? There, maybe it's not this, maybe Nike wasn't, maybe Jalen Brown is speculating here and maybe he's just, it is a conspiracy theory, but I'm sure there's a, there's a certain level of, of politics that's involved in these things. For example, on the women's side, we all, we all respect Diana Taurasi. She's the great, if not the greatest women's basketball player, one of the best, but 
ultimately she hasn't been performing to that level but she's there because of politics she's there because she's a veteran and that's completely fine for everybody i i nobody's complaining about diana tarasi being on the team but that is some level of of not just basketball skill that's the reason why you're there so i think there's always some form of basis for these things that isn't just are you the best basketball player on the court? And it's and it's not only like like you were saying like that's not a bad thing like we can respect that you know if she's there for that reason if someone is not there because they're a rookie that's something but like be public about it be forthcoming about it I think it's you know the thing that that probably is frustrating for Jalen Brown looking in on the situation is hey why can't we just admit that like there's a little bit more going on behind the scenes than the X's and O's on a basketball court and I think it's that that discrepancy that's maybe driving some of the frustration behind this. And by the way, I mean, look no further than one of my favorite examples, Udonis Haslam, uh, for the evidence that sometimes you do keep someone around, even if they're not one of the five leading scorers, because they are a player coach, they are good for morale, they're, they are, you know, the core fabric of the team, they're part of the gang, all that makes sense to me. Uh, one last note I would make on the Caitlin Clark stuff too. I want to make sure we don't misquote, although I actually agree that, even though she didn't say the following, she probably also meant this. Don Staley didn't come outright and say, we wish Caitlin Clark was on, or even that we should have put her on, although I think that's also the case. What she said was, if we had to do it again now, she would make the team. And of course, that allows her to protect herself because it's like, well, yeah, factually, Caitlin Clark ironically started playing much better after they didn't put her on the Olympic team. But I think it's also probably true that do they wish she was on? I mean, it was it was a fun debate. You know, you don't make these decisions necessarily for ratings, but at the same time, you know, you want everyone, you want the fans to be interested in watching. And it's like, gee, even if you can defend the argument of not having her on based on her play in her first few months in the league, interest-wise, it was a no-brainer to put her on. Yeah, I mean, flipping it back over to the men's briefly to close things out here, but... Do we think that, or, you know, even on the women's side, right? Do we think that this commentary, what you're hearing in the media surrounding all this, like, does that seep in to these next couple of weeks in Paris? Obviously you have guys who are, you know, maybe don't know each other super well, or they're playing together for some of the first times or some of the only times in their career. Does this stuff have the chance to permeate a little bit more than it would for like a true close knit group of NBA players who are on a continuous team together? I personally think that, because of the people who are leading the team, because it's LeBron James, because it's Steph Curry, this team is going to always say, hey, let's keep the main thing the main thing. And even in the, the women's side, Asia Wilson is such a strong leader, and that's that's all that they've been talking about. Now, I think I don't think it's going to see personally don't think it's going to seep in there, but it's the after that I'm that I'm really concerned about or that I'm thinking will uh, have an effect. If if you have your your managing director of USA men's basketball you know, basically saying the word conspiracy theory, like I think there's going to be a little bit of ruffled feathers even because just because of the term. I think it's a term, right? Um, so it, it, I think there are going to be more players that are going to be like Jalen Brown and Kyrie Irving and maybe, you know, whoever comes down the line, that, that will be a little bit more difficult, especially because I think 2028 is probably going to be the first year where Team USA is going to be a little compromised, at least from the men's side. My quick answer, John, on, you know, does the media affect things not to give us too much power? Absolutely. I mean, any of these guys, any of these guys who say they're not reading the headlines, they're seeing it. And then especially even more than any other sport, the NBA and recently the WNBA, I used to call the NBA the social media league. I mean, these guys are mixing it up, responding to people publicly. Yes, they're seeing it. Yes, everything that comes out affects everything. I mean, you know, just last week, uh, our reporter, Margaret Fleming, interviewed Nadia Rawlinson, who's a, a co-owner of the Chicago Sky. And I noticed in the interview that Nadia said, um, to those who said something about why we're spending so much now on our new practice facility, I don't usually respond to social media comments. I try not to read social media. And I thought, you know, respectfully, if you even have to say it, and if you're taking the, the moment to respond to it, you, you read it, you see it, everyone sees it, whether it's execs, players, coaches, Oh yeah, what gets said in the media uh, affects the the interplay and the locker room camaraderie, all of it. Totally, yeah, it's an, a very interconnected situation in the locker room with the media. We'll keep an eye on things going forward. But Colin Salau, Dan Roberts, thank you so much for joining today.
The Chicago Sky unveiled new plans for a brand new practice facility last week, an important step in the WNBA building up its infrastructure. FOS reporter Margaret Fleming got to sit down with Chicago Sky co-owner Nadia Rawlinson to dive into the NBA's new infrastructure and why the league's financial upside is growing every day. Nadia Rawlinson, thank you so much for joining um, us at Front Office Sports. We're excited to talk to you about the Chicago Sky and all the new things you have going on. Um, first of all, the Sky and the whole WNBA are in a weird part of the season right now. You're coming off of a huge all-star weekend where, you know, you had you had players down in Phoenix, you know, making all-star history um, and now having this break. You know, how has how has your summer break been so far, your, your <laughs> Olympic break? Not very um, relaxing, that's for sure. Um, so I was in All Star in Phoenix for All Star Weekend, which was fantastic, supporting Angel Reese in her first All Star run. It was great to see her and Caitlin Clark as the first double rookies to uh, be on the All Star team in ten years. So that's pretty amazing. Um, and clearly, it was uh, I think from a just a, a moment in sports and women sports, it was a pretty incredible. Uh, entertainment experience. The product on the court was fantastic. The game was exciting. The atmosphere was electric while you were there. All the sponsors, all the lights, camera action you would expect at um, a game of that stature uh, definitely uh, presented itself. So it was a really amazing weekend. So that was just all-star week. And then fast forward, we run into this week and announcing our new practice facility, which was also a, a dream of ours. Then it was really wonderful to have the opportunity for that to come to fruition. So you know, no rest for the weary and uh, headed to the Olympics uh, in the next week or so. So, oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. Exciting summer for you, for sure. The All-Star Game was so incredible for so many reasons. I mean, we saw the viewership numbers and especially just mm -hmm. having the Team Olympics versus Team WNBA, like going head to head. It was so much more exciting than so many All-Star Games usually are because it was such a competition. And to see WNBA right. come out on top, it was it was a really incredible game. Yeah, yeah really it was, was. Cool. Yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned the practice facility. It's huge news um, for any of our listeners who aren't aware. This guy, earlier this week, reports came out that they might be moving to a practice facility much closer um, to the city um, at, at a spot near the airport. And then um, yesterday, the news came out that it would be uh, at that site, but next to it. So not just taking over the site, but the sky are going to build their own facility Net right new. next door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brand new. Um, and it's going to be, I think it was $38 million? Practice million. facility, yeah, really exciting news. Tell me, Nadia, why is this the right time for the team to make this move? Well, this was something that we'd been thinking about for a while. Like, contrary to all the uh, comments, and I try not to read comments on social media, but uh, any of the uh, those that have hot takes about our our journey, um, this was not something that was just thought of. It wasn't something that just because I toured a facility that no, oh, now it's time for us to get ours. If anyone who is in business or understands commercial real estate and how these things work, there's long lead times. Um, and also we've been making this a priority for the last 18 months, at least, if not longer. Um, but this was the moment where all the stars came into alignment from the location to the right partnership with uh, someone who has a similar values to ours um, and uh, the right uh, build out that we were looking for with the financials that can make this sustainable over time. Again, this is not something we're just doing for the moment. We're looking to have a sustainable enterprise uh, that's run really well, that provides the best um, support and investment in our athletes and uh, players. And we do, we have that. So this was the moment for us. Yeah, awesome. And I'm really curious, this is in partnership with the Village of Bedford Park mm -hmm. where it's going to be located. The Village of Bedford Park, I've grown up going to Chicago Bulls games and White Sox games and seeing them marketing all over the place. I didn't realize until looking into this that it's, exactly. it's only a couple hundred people. Like I think it was like That's 600 people or something. What has it been like working with them. And, They're amazing. Yeah. And it's, it's the perfect partnership for us because, you know, the mayor, we have uh, the city clerk, we have the chief of police, we have the, you know, chief of the fire department. Everyone is supporting of this. And uh, we know everyone that is anyone to know in Bedford Park from a municipality perspective. Um, we've broken bread literally together, uh, pot belly sandwiches around a table um, to figure out how we can get this deal done. Um, you know, blueprints and, you know, the brick screens, you know, doing all the renderings, meeting with all the architects. We're all there in partnership together. So they're the best partners that we could have in this endeavor. And we're really proud to uh, stand alongside them in this public-private partnership. That's so interesting. Yeah, I love the pot belly note. That's so Chicago. It's true. I mean, it's, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we're seeing this as a growing trend. You mentioned, you know, in Phoenix, they just opened theirs. 
the storm mm -hmm. earlier this year and then mm -hmm. Las Vegas last year. I mean, the league has been around for decades. Why do you think we're seeing right now just in the last year and the Liberty are opening theirs soon? You know, they're committed to that. Why do you think we're seeing this trend all of a sudden of teams being like, yeah, we're going to go ahead. We're going to build our own. We're going to do our own thing. And I think it's the it. flywheel effect, right? So a lot of things have to be true for this moment to have existed and for this inflection point to occur. Um, they had some component parts, but they all need to be working in concert with one another. So not only do we have, have always had great product on the court, we now have great talent in the pipeline that's coming up in the college ranks. We had an amazing, we've always had great draft classes, but I think this was a particularly noteworthy one. Um, we have really great competitiveness among teams. So that's really exciting. So you don't know or can predict the outcomes of games, which is really exciting for live events and live TV, one of the few remaining properties that are out there that can drive that level of engagement. And speaking of engagement, we have new, net new fans that are coming to the sport in droves, driven through a lot of the NCAA sort of competition. And then of course, with the W, all of this is happening at the same time. And then finally, you have um, two things I think are important. One, you have investment, people like me coming in um, with a level of uh, sophistication around how do we think about making this a business, not a cause, and making this sustainable over time and running a really great enterprise. Um, and you have people who are really investing real dollars in this in ways that are more than a hobby. Um, and I think that's important in, in concert with everything else. And then finally, you have sort of a little bit of the rivalry going on. People want to see a great story. They want to root for their players and uh, understand like how they're aligned with the people that they care about. And, and we have a little bit of drama too. So all that makes for you know great uh, destination engagement and viewership on TV and sort of uh, games to watch. Um, so I think all of that comes to this place where if we're going to invest and build our own sort of sustainable um, um, assets that we're adding to our franchise, and this is a huge capital commitment, huge time commitment, um, you know, leveling up in a way that has never been done before. And I think there just wasn't a, um, a thought that this was um, that a franchise could carry this. And, and we're now at a place where we can because all of those things are working together at this moment in time. Absolutely. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about your facility, of course. All, you know, two courts, all the amenities, private mm -hmm. kitchen, things like that. But mm -hmm. something that really stuck out to me was the content studios mm -hmm. and the beauty uh, areas. Yep. Yeah, the stations. Mm -hmm. What went into that decision? And, and kind of is that part of the sky saying, you know, this is our brand now is building, you know, building our esteem. Well, we off see the, the whole court player, as well. right? It's not just, yeah. you know, yeah. the, you know, the basketball player in the four lines on the court, you know, they have full lives. Um, you can see, I'm just, you know, I don't know if you follow any of our players, but, you know, on social media, Angel Reese is in London or Paris. I don't even know which city she's in now, um, you know, and, and after, you know, just leaving Phoenix from um, the All-Star game. And, you know, and, and we embrace that. We embrace our players being their best selves in whatever way they want to express that. Um, everybody delivers what's required for their day job. And they also can have, you know, an expressive life outside of, uh, the sky and we want to create the facilities and support to show them that we see them and that this is something that's great also and we're women and these are things we like we are deep into content creation we're in live in a digital media age we cannot ignore that we do that at the sky part of our marketing our, our social team is elite i think and you know we love sort of our team and what they've done in the content they've created so this is not only just for our front office but for the players themselves and then from a beauty perspective this has been something that's been trending um for the last year and a half that they've uh, sort of pierced the fashion zeitgeist and people are looking at you know their tunnel fits and what's the drip and how are we looking um for you know um, uh, on you know what the players are wearing to games, et cetera, and, and around the cities and in their personal lives. Like this is this is the moment. So we're here for all of that. We want to support that. Yeah, and do you see part of that as sort of how the the Bulls and the White Sox have become these global brands that transcend you know sport? Even do you see that as as an avenue that the sky could go down with Absolutely. all the content creation for its players? You know, not just it could presence. be anything, right? So I think. Yeah. You know, they, they, people like to say sky's the limit, you know, with Chicago sky's a play on words. And I think we're limitless. Um, and this is just one example of that. Yeah, really cool. And and I saw also um, it was reported that, you know, the target neighborhood that the players could go live in it would be the South Loop. Can you talk a little bit about what might be possible in that kind of outside of basketball um, sphere for these players once they're living downtown or, or somewhere closer uh, to the city? What might be possible in partnerships and things? 
with that? Yeah, so I, the South Loop, just because it's that's where our arena is uh, with Wind Trust, where we play our games. It's 11 miles from our practice facility. I've timed it both in traffic and out. It's not traffic. It's anywhere from 14 minutes to 22 minutes. So, it, you know, it's it's great. Uh, just the South Loop is a great look. I used to live in the South Loop and two or three different places. is a great neighborhood, walkable, great restaurants, a whole cultural vibe, which is cool. And you're right there next to the lake. Um, but, you know, it just depends on where players can, you know, they want to live on um, various places. That's where we're targeting. But downtown is 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 where we want our players to be. So once this um, practice facility comes online and we're able to um, move everything down uh, towards uh, Bedford Park and sort of house our players downtown, that's the goal. Yeah, yeah. And I just say South Loop because that's just where it's the easiest and they have mm -hmm. lots of housing inventory and it's a great place to live. Um, but, you know, I, I can just imagine now I have, you know, different, you know, condominiums and apartments coming to, you know, ping my inbox. Like, you should have your players live here. So, you know, it could be South Loop. It could be West Loop. It could be, you know, anywhere. <laughs> I don't want to limit us, but that that's what seems like it makes the most sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, the South Loop is a great and growing neighborhood. I feel like yes. there's always a new condominium going up there it's true. all the time. <laughs> all the time. Yes. All the time. Yeah. So you have a lot of options there, but I mean, there's so many great places down right. close to Winterest that the players could live. I think it'll be really cool to see, you know, to see them and what they're able to do. Like we said, with all this content, with all like documenting their lives off the court, being downtown, what that might look like for the team. Mm -hmm. That's going to be really cool, I think. Um, I want to ask as well, I spoke to a couple of fans last week who talked about how their prices for first season tickets went up. It's going to happen around the league and it already has started happening around the league. It's just what happens when, mm -hmm. you know, leagues get more exposure. Was there any connection to this practice facility? Because some of them had said maybe it's going toward a new practice facility. They're kind of speculating. Is that connected at all or those are separate things? It's totally separate things. I mean, if you imagine these are for net new prices for coming up in the future seasons and we have to pay for the facility, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, before next season. So, no, they're two separate things. And we were very, very careful about our pricing. I know there was a little bit of consternation and quite honestly, I would say, we could have done a little bit better about communicating that up front, honestly. Um, so there wasn't such a shock and awe, but also this is a signal that things are growing and you want to invest in the team. You have to pay more for things that are worth more. And like, I mean, that's what it is. And yes, the ticket prices, I made a strategic decision that we were gonna price our courtside feet on wood seats a lot higher than those that were in our mid-tier sort of VIP seats that were a lot less um, of a, a jump for those that were in our upper bowls because those that are getting premium seats should take bear more of the expense on the increase that, you know, so we can still remain accessible to those that are in the mid-tier and the lower tiers, right? So um, all that was very thoughtful. We did not, this was not a mistake. This was not something that we just sort of like, huh, let's see what happens and what's people's willingness to pay. We ran all the models, we looked at it, we were very careful around looking at sort of different tranches of how long certain season ticket holders have been with us, should we be rewarding those who've been with us when nobody was coming to the games? I mean, all of this uh, conversation um, occurred. Um, so again, I don't want people to think this was a, uh, a reckless decision. It was one to take advantage of the market and the value creation we have put together It will that will increase the fan experience. We can invest more in the experience in the day of the games. Um, we'll have uh, we have better, you know, entertainment for halftime shows. Um, I mean, everything. It's like rising tide raises all ships. So all this is good is going back to investing in the franchise and the product demands it. And we should be able to uh, uh, charge what the market will bear. That's a really great answer, really peeling back the layers of the behind the scenes of what's going mm -hmm. on in a decision like that. Thank you. Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about kind of the future and what's going on in the next couple of years. Let's bring it back to just the rest of the season after the Olympic break. What are you looking forward to? What do you, you know, what's still looking to work the on? playoffs? That's what we're looking forward to. I'm calling it right now. So <laughs> I, I maybe, you know, people may say I'm a little over my skis, but I, I have faith in us. And Spoon is an amazing coach. And I think our players are just starting to gel. Um, we're a new team, as you know, you've seen. Um, and I think given for us being literally a team that's been sort of being reconstituted, we've done, you know, pretty well. So I, I'm excited about the future and what this second half of the season will bring. Awesome. Nadia, thank you so much for speaking with me and for all your thoughts. This was just wonderful and hearing more. And you sure have a lot on your plate. It's It'll be exciting to watch it in the next couple of years all unfold. Well, and thank you for covering us in uh, Let's Go Sky. That's all we've got for today. But big thanks to our guests, Dan Roberts, Colin Salau, Alex Schiffer, and of course, Nadia Rollinson. Please make sure to send the show to a friend or a colleague and make sure you're subscribing on YouTube for more exclusive conversations. 
I'm John James. This has been Front Office Sports Today. We'll talk tomorrow.